Hello, and welcome to episode five of Blue Leadership with your host, Dennis Nair. Dennis is a 25-year law enforcement veteran and retired chief from the state of New York. He is also a proud graduate of the 240th session of the FBI National Academy and the 61st session of the FBI LIDA Institute. The Blue Leadership video podcast is brought to you by the nationally ranked Master of Science in Law Enforcement and Public Safety Leadership Program at the University of San Diego. You can learn more about the LEPSL program at criminaljustice.sandiego.edu. And with that, I will kick things over to your host to introduce our featured guest. Thank you, everyone. Kylie, thank you. Um, as always, great to be here. And uh, today's guest is going to be Commander Jeff Strassner of the Colorado Springs, Colorado Police Department. Um, Jeff is a graduate of the LEPSL program. Um, he has 26 years in law enforcement. Uh, 24 of those years are with the Colorado Springs, Colorado Police Department. And um, he's come up through the ranks. He's been an officer, a sergeant, a lieutenant, and um, a commander since 2017. Um, Colorado Springs, um, for those who don't know, is a large city with military installations. There's five of them. There's about a um, 500,000 person population and lots more that um, uh, Commander Strasser is going to talk about. So, Commander, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jen and Dennis. I really appreciate it. And before we get going, uh, we were talking before. I just want to compliment you back for the times that we were in class together. The discussion boards were always great. When uh, I heard that you were selected for Lepsil faculty, I thought that was just an awesome choice. I think this podcast is proof of that, and I'm really honored to be here today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so actually, so for the first question, if you for the listeners and the viewers, can you just kind of share a little bit about what the uh, dynamics are in Colorado Springs with in terms of um, just the, the policing dynamics and what the community is like? Yeah, so I could honestly talk about our city all day. I love living here. Um, we are about an hour south of Denver. We were built on, a, on kind of a high, mount, uh, high desert plains, and so we get about 300 days of sunshine a year. We're packed right against the mountains um, with a very large wildlife urban interface. Uh, we get, um, it's just, it's an amazing view every day to step outside and see the 14,000 plus foot Pikes Peak out there at your window. Um, just pretty remarkable. Our community was founded on the idea of creating a health resort that we've kind of lived, um, we continue to carry that on today. It's, it's home to uh, all kinds of great outdoor regional parks for mountain biking, running, horseback riding. They're right here in the middle of the city. Um, we're nicknamed Olympic City USA because we have the U.S. Olympic Committee, the Training Center, and the brand new Olympic Paralympic Museum that just opened and about 24 of the national governing bodies for sports like USA Cycling, Swimming, Boxing, and a whole bunch of others. Um, as you noted, we have five military installations, uh, Fort Carson being the home of the 4th Infantry Division, as well as four Air Force bases, including the United States Air Force Academy. Um, Policing-wise, we are generally a very conservative community, maybe considered the conservative stronghold of the state, which because of that, I think we still enjoy a lot of community support that maybe other, other communities are not getting right now. And so um, still a great place to live, great place to work. Um, from a pandemic resiliency perspective, our city is growing. Uh, we're coming out of the pandemic with a stronger economy than we went into it because of all the construction that's going on. Um, we're just overall in really good shape considering all that's gone on in the, in the nation. So thank you for that. And now that kind of sets the template for really what we're going to talk about. And that's a problem that's and the challenge that's nationally in every city, big and small um, across the country. And that's homelessness. And when you look at, uh, you know, we're a country with a population of around 330 million and a population of around 330 million with a homeless population of roughly 500,000. And um, it, it's something that all police agencies encounter. And I know that in your time through the ranks, you've had a lot of positions that were community oriented, that were neighborhood resource and school resource. But one of the things you did was you were in charge of, I think when you were a sergeant, um, the homeless outreach team. And then that's something that 
you help expand in the Colorado, city of Colorado Springs really does some innovative things toward helping to improve upon. So can you tell us a little bit about what homelessness um, is like in the city of Colorado Springs? Yeah, so I, I was fortunate to come in as one of the first supervisors of the homeless outreach team, but quite honestly, it was after, um, and I'll talk about it in a little bit here, but the officers that started that team um, are Herman Goldstein Award winners for the community policing that they were involved. I just got to uh, help with some of the maintenance of that over time. Um, our our homeless population is about 1,156. If you if you look at a point in time survey done by HUD, um, that's been a fairly consistent number for about the last decade. Our uh, our community partners they do a community count, which they believe it's closer to 2,000 homeless living in the community. Our our we really have about 358 that are considered the the chronic unsheltered. Um, but that is, that's actually been a 30% decrease or so since 2018. That, that number has dropped uh, every year, um, um, I think since about 2018. So that number keeps going down. Our, our average over the last five years is about 414 uh, unsheltered. So we're well below that average. Um, I'm sorry, about 182 are our chronic homeless. And those are the ones that there's a definition by um, the federal government through HUD that determines what chronic homelessness is. And we have 182 of those that are within the community as well. And do you, do you find that the trilogy is existing that, you know, with homelessness, it's not just homelessness itself, then it becomes a substance abuse connection. And then sometimes a mental health um, connection because, you know, they kind of feed on one another and it, it kind of makes a person's life spiral downward because of the initial effect of whether it be homelessness to start it or maybe mental health issues started and the other two follow. Have you seen that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of co-diagnosis among that community and, and every every person's story is obviously different. Um, some of the, the substance abuse might come first before the homelessness. For others, it might be the other way around. Um, but, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of dual diagnosis that are involved uh, with this population. Yeah, and it's always frustrating that I don't think people really understand that. I think they think, well, people can just get a job. And it's really, it's not that easy because what are they going to put on a resume when someone looks for an address or where are they going to get their mail or, you know, even having a place to shower and have a phone. And I think the pandemic and, and some other things has probably shown that more people can be susceptible to becoming homeless than, than they probably realize. And have you seen that as well in terms of people who find themselves just in a position that all of a sudden now they are experiencing homelessness? Well, anecdotally, from the early days of our homeless outreach team, uh, it was pretty incredible to find to, to hear the story of some of the people that we were finding out on the street. Um, one gentleman had actually been a scientist on the Hubble Space Telescope and had built a solar powered recording studio for him playing his guitar and his music within his tent. And so you really have no idea who's out there and, and what brought them to that point. I mean, every one of these folks has a story. And, and I think that's the human side of it that gets really easy to forget when you are looking at, you know, 500 camps in a creek bed uh, in, the, in the trash and everything that accumulates with that, you forget the individual human story behind each person. And for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think that human element is so important because it's, it could be any of us at any time by some twist of fate or set of circumstances. And, and with that, what are some of the things that your homelessness outreach team and, and specifically the Colorado Springs, Colorado Police Department does to try to help this situation? So there's a there's a the early days, if you will, and then there's what we do now. And as any program, you know, gets started, there's always this evolutionary process or this change. Um, and if I can, I'll talk a little bit about both the old and the new. In uh, about 07 or 08, um, we had we were threatened with a lawsuit for allegedly cleaning up homeless camps and taking somebody's military medals and personal documents. 
Um, the short story of that is the guy that was accusing us of stealing his military medals wasn't actually a veteran, but that that threat of the lawsuit was pretty significant. Um, we were demanded to halt doing all camp cleanups based on a violation of Fourth Amendment search and seizure. And at the time, we didn't have any type of ordinance in place to uh, prohibit camping on public property. So all of our creek beds, our bike trails, um, all of those areas were full of camps. The estimated number was between five and 800, depending on which survey or person you were talking to. And so with the lawsuit, uh, our chief at the time um, basically selected a couple officers that had a very strong community policing, problem-oriented policing background. And he said, you know, I'm going to put you on a six-month temporary duty assignment. Go see what you can do about this problem. Um, the team immediately extended into three officers so that they could have the full coverage. And uh, they started to go out and, and try to make way into the homeless camps and talk to people and meet with uh, all of our different community service providers and were essentially shunned. They're, they had their backs turned on them. They were ignored. Um, it wasn't a great police perspective with our service providers and how they thought we were treating the homeless people. Um, so really what they did is they stripped down in the plain clothes for the next month. They went around meeting with different, different service providers, trying to get their foot in the door. Um, there was someone here that kind of took a chance on them, if you will, and said, well, let's, let's try this. And, um, they ended up getting some other service providers involved and they went, uh, flew to Florida, met with Pinellas County to see some of the stuff they were doing there and went, you know what, we can do better. And they took the model that was in Pinellas County and then morphed that to fit our community. And um, really at that point, they, they started really getting inroads into the service providers and meeting with them on a regular basis. And, uh, they learned that one of the biggest needs in the homeless community was socks. And so they filled the trunk of their car with socks and they started just walking in the camps, passing out socks and talking to people. And that started to open up a lot of doors where uh, the, 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 the folks living in those communities were starting to trust them. And, and in fact, one, uh, one individual that ended up being wanted for homicide um, when this kind of evolution of the relationship with the homeless community is when um, he was wanted for homicide, they knew exactly who he was by the description where he lived. They went, they talked to him and he's like, I will only talk to you. I will not talk to anybody else. So if you want an interview, it's going to have to be with you kind of thing. Um, so really, really great uh, growth in that relationship and trust that was created with even um one of the agencies that originally refused to meet with the police um, later opened doors, was involved in uh, uh, helping supervise the volunteers that would go out and do camp cleanups once those resumed. Um, our team actually worked with the ACLU, which is not common for a lot of agencies, but they worked with the ACLU to create a uh, ordinance to prohibit camping on public property. The ordinance was developed so that the only people that could enforce it were the homeless outreach team. And the only way a citation could be issued was if there were available beds in the shelters. And so it was, there was a lot of give and take in that process. Um, but really in those early years, they helped rehouse about 400 people and didn't have to issue a single ticket for the camping on public property. So and if, if, so if we broke this really down into two main points, it's really quality relational policing, establishing those relationships and treating people as humans and providing dignity and, and really getting to know that subset of the population and policing in a community oriented policing type of mode. And it's also partnerships because those outreach specialists, those they are able to do things that police struggle with doing and and am i right those two things would really be the two main things that help the program work it, it, yeah it really was amazing when when they first started going out while they were initially shunned as they as they worked their way into those relationships 
a lot of the service providers weren't really working together either. Everybody was doing their own thing, kind of had their own agenda. And, and what happened is that hot team all of a sudden became the central hub of the wheel, if you will, being a bridge, not only for the service providers together, um, but also getting referring the homeless to those different service providers. So it was really a remarkable experience for them as they went through that. Um, now that, that has obviously changed over time, but that was the early years of that program and why uh, they won the Herman Goldstein Award in 2010. And, and I think you, your agency probably really had a leg up on some of what came through with the entire reimagination of policing across our country, because a lot of it was really exploring how do police stop being involved in things they shouldn't be involved in solely. And, and some of the things that really came up as core components of that were issues of homelessness, mental health, addiction. And as we said at the beginning, those three are all somewhat married together at times. And to know that your agency was well in advance of what came through in, in 2020 and from in terms of discussion, that probably had to be very helpful for your agency's success. It, it really was. And, and one of the neat things that came out of that Herman Goldstein Award process is the runners up that year were Houston Police Department, where they had already started a co-responder kind of model. And when they came back from the Herman Goldstein Award uh, ceremony and presentations, they went, you know what, we can do what Houston is doing. And they added a counselor to their team back, you know, almost a decade ago, we were starting to look at that kind of stuff. And from that program evolved a different community program for us, which is our co-responder model here in the Springs, that we were well ahead of that curve, too, because of that evolution and, and some great leadership here in the department that were forced, you know, for thinking to put those things together. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, I think, misnomers is I think people sometimes think that if someone is homeless, that they're more likely to be um, involved in crime or a criminal where it's really, where your experience is showing that it's more likely that they will be victims of crime. Um, was your, did your statistics show anything toward either, either end of that? You know, it's, it's, we don't have a method of collecting the data on our homeless population as far as victimization. I think anecdotally, we can talk about things that we've witnessed or seen, but we really don't have good statistics to show that we match the national standard, which, you know, I saw some research studies that said that they're, you know, much more prevalent to be victimized. Uh, I think arrest and arrest rates are much more higher as well. And if you, so if, if we really look at this when we, cause really the goal is harm reduction and, and improving lives and whatever we do. And that's really as our mission is, is focused on that aspect for police agencies. What do you think they can do to, if they're already doing it or to either start or enhance it, would it be starting the talks of, of the partnerships, um, having people from the, those co-responder models, um, if you had to just really come up with one or two salient points that really would drive this um, home in a positive way, what would those be? So I think for me, there were really four great takeaways. Um, one, it, it, Captain Britt talked about it during your episode two, and that is we're here to help people. Most of us took the oath to help people and to serve. And when you go into the homeless population, it's not how do we deal with them? It's how do we help them? And I think that's the first perspective you have to have. Um, the second takeaway from this to me is, uh, you know, Lepsel program is about leadership. And when you look at the boldness of our chief at that time to say, I want you guys to go do this for six months and just see what you can do and pick the right people and trusted them to be engaged. That took a lot of courage to do that. And those guys direct reported to a commander who had some oversight, but they really got to work the Sarah model and go out and create those relationships. Um, the, and, and, you know, the third one, which really is my, my personal opinion here, and it's kind of the direction we've moved now, is the, the hub is no longer the homeless outreach team. Our hub is now the city. And we have a city homeless coordinator and all of these resources work together, the money flows together, and the police are now doing more enforcement because sometimes, you know, you need 
I've been involved in problem solving courts for quite some time now. And sometimes you need the, the stick in order to get to the carrot and help people get the help they need. And so we are doing a lot more enforcement than we have in the past to lead them uh, into some of those problem solving methodologies and to get them the help they need. And the last one, we've said it over and over and over, community, community, community. We have to engage the full range of resources available in the community um, to create sheltering beds, to create transitional housing, to get the mental health, to get the physical, you know, doctors and clinics. And it, it is a full community problem. It is not just a policing problem. And we, we have to have a seat at the table, but maybe not run the table. For sure. And, you know, and, and in um, one of the cities that I led, we had the same experiences with, you know, large homeless encampments in, in terms of where people were actually giving birth in those conditions. And, and you ha agree and have to have medical involved. You have to have places that can get them the help that they need. And, and, and like you said, maybe even sometimes prodding them to do that. And then as long as there's some sort of alternative to incarceration, because that won't really help them get out of their problem. It'll probably make them spiral more. Absolutely. And, and that's the neat part about having the city so intimately involved at the city leadership level with the mayor and the council is you know, we have a, a, an outreach court program that just started, which is a warrant amnesty day that's actually conducted inside one of our service providers at, at the rescue mission. And they can come in and if they have multiple warrants for municipal violations of camping or whatever the case is, they can get those squashed. They can get a new court date to try to get back on track. And they're right there with case managers at the rescue mission to help them get back on track. And so it is a holistic with work programs and, you know, the housing, as we talked about, all of that goes together. Yeah. And I think there's no better story for a law enforcement officer to hear is a success, a success story where someone can say that they went from homelessness to getting, um, getting back into school and getting a degree and then job placement and then having a house and just knowing what they've come through. And it's the truth is they cannot do it alone. And it really requires everyone in their respective roles to really be part of a team. Absolutely. To the gentleman I mentioned earlier, the Hubble Space Telescope guy, um, at the time we had some grant money where we could put people on a bus and send them home to where there were family ready to catch them. And this individual ended up getting put on a bus, went back to California, and about a year or two later, he mailed a compact disc album that he had produced. And he was, he was now in a music career uh, in California. I mean, those are, those are the wins, right? That's what you really look for. And, and as an aside, we said at the beginning that it could be anyone. And there's something that had gone viral on YouTube, and it was from Carlos Santana's musical group. And it was, I believe, his drummer who was living out of a van and was homeless. And a, a reporter just happened to ask him who he is and what he did. And he happened to mention, well, he used to um, be a part of Carlos Santana's band. And wow. so there was a follow up and Carlos Santana actually came out and met him. And just a genuine, true story of it could be anyone. And I think having that that mindset and that, you know, that heart set of as law enforcement, the goal is to help do what we can to reduce the harm, to improve the situations and partner with as many people and groups as we can, because doing that, I think will give the most chances for success. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and with that, Commander, any final closing thoughts for the viewers and listeners as to if they have a question or, or where they can help further what they're already doing or maybe expand if there was any couple of points you think they should really focus? You know, for me, when we talk about, there's been so much discussion of late about intelligence-led policing, and we sometimes forget that even within intelligence-led policing is the importance of the community engaging them and the problem-oriented policing. I firmly believe the SARA model was made for intelligence-led policing. The very first part of scanning is getting all the information and in, in, that you can about the problem. And I think that is still a very solid methodology today to engage our stakeholders and to really try to make an impact on where our crime problems are. What, so. a, what a great way to end it. I, I just think, yeah, that's it. Um, incorporate intelligence-led policing, incorporate partnerships, incorporate a heart um, approach to it. And um, 
I think that's where we're going to truly start seeing positive results. Um, Commander, much thank you for sharing that. Um, I know Kylie's going to come back in and close us out. And um, I, I'm very confident that um, this is a topic that we we all need to be considering as we go about our careers in law enforcement. Thank you very much, Dennis. Appreciate it today. Look forward to chatting with you again in the future someday. For sure. Kylie? Yeah, thank you both for your time today. And thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to meet the law enforcement heroes and leaders who are a part of the MS Lepsil family. Um, if you'd like to watch previous episodes of Blue Leadership, you can find them on the video tab of our Facebook page or by searching USD Blue Leadership on YouTube. Uh, thanks, everyone, and we will see you next time. Bye.